Hello, welcome everyone, and welcome to our evening event. It's evening in New York and wherever you are, but good morning and good afternoon and good, I guess, good day, wherever you are. Um, OSF is thrilled to be able to host today's discussion with several talented artists, producers, and curators about the ways in which documentary photography especially those by women and gender non-conforming people from communities of color are really reshaping the way in which we understand the world around us. So today, basically what we would be doing is we have welcome four phenomenal artists to share their work with us. We're going to then open up with a panel discussion to think a little bit more about, to understand more about community-based photography and um, how the artists work, especially in the context of COVID. Um, and please do send us questions and comments throughout the event. Um, you may not be able to see other people's chat, but we have a moderator who will be able to raise them to us and will be able to answer them if we have the chance. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to also like, introduce our panelists. Who are here with us. We are very, very happy to be joined by um, four artists and part of the We Women project. Um, Tonika, Tonika, we just talked about this, Tonika Johnson, um, Arin Yoon, um, Katie Vasil, and um, Mayela Rodriguez. And Daniela is joining us also in her role as one of the co-founders of We Women. And we'll talk a little bit more about how all of this came to be. Um, you know, I am really thrilled to be co to be moderating this event and I guess in discussion with you, all of you tonight because um, it's a rather unusual event, really, uh, for someone in my position uh, to, be, to be discussing. I am a team manager in the Women's Rights Program at Open Society Foundation. And the work that I do supports our portfolio of grantees that are around the power of the collective, which really is thinking about feminist movements and leaders. And the we, what what really drew me to the We Women project is really about what it was trying to focus on and bring our attention to, but also what it was trying to change. So let me tell you a little bit about that. I think what we see around us really tells us about the place in the, the world and our place in it, and actually t starts to really form the stories that we tell ourselves. You know, it's not really, it's not just about highbrow art and culture that we consume intentionally, but really the images around us in the newspapers and advertising, in TV and social media, like all of these images reflect and shape cultural norms through which we understand the world around us. And I think that these images also shape narratives about communities. They shape the, the narratives that communities um, themselves understand the political and social problems that they face, and also the solutions that um, respond to these issues and that what is possible. And so who creates these images is therefore so important. And so for far too long, um, visual storytelling has really been dominated by a largely homogenous field, right? white, male, and privileged. And this is really why I think the We Women Project is really exciting and why I'm really excited for us to talk to everyone today is that we are also focused on the who, the what, and the how of photography in the United States in a moment where our visual landscape and community stories are so polarized. But what is really amazing about a lot of this work is that it also puts forward visions of alternative feminist futures. And so why don't we start with a little introduction into the We Women project, and then we'll kind of see a little bit more about everyone's work. Thank you. The United States is more divided than ever, and we're in a prolonged period of crisis. From immigration to healthcare to incarceration to the environment, critical issues need to be in the spotlight more than ever. Our response is We Women, the largest photo project currently underway across the U.S. by women and non-binary artists. 
By reframing issues, our goal is to challenge how everyone understands this country and bring about social change. In the U.S., women have been historically disempowered in social and political systems, and we have not been in control of our own stories. We Women seeks to upend that tradition. Diversifying the voices that tell our stories is crucial if we want to more completely understand the challenges we face as a nation. We aim to not only revolutionize who is in charge of telling stories, but how. We women artists focus on the most important issues of the 21st century through photography, community engagement, and grassroots activism. We want to figure out how to generate empathy, social impact, and tangible change through national conversations fueled by art. The first phase of We Women features 20 projects in key states and a traveling national exhibition starting in 2021. We Women artists examine critical issues ranging from climate change, political participation and gentrification, to health, migration, and sexuality. Their work highlights the vital role the arts can play in social change movements by visualizing issues, attracting attention, connecting change makers, and bridging dialogues. We Women believes we can change how we see our world and ultimately ourselves. Thank you. Um, well, we're going to start by looking at a deeper dive into a lot of um, and four of our the projects in We Women. We're going to open with Tonika's project about Chicago's historic segregation and the impact that it has on us today. Um, are we ready? Excellent. Hi, my name is Tonika Lewis Johnson, and I am from Chicago, Illinois. And my We Women project is Folded Map. Before I explain to you what the project actually is, let me just pro provide a little context. This is what Chicago segregation looks like. This is a map of Chicago. The purple pink that you see is the north side of Chicago, and it is made of predominantly white neighborhoods. 15 miles south in the blue part of the map that is known as the south side. And the south side is comprised of predominantly black neighborhoods. And so folded map literally folds Chicago's map in half to where the purple part of the map and the blue part of the map touch each other. So through maps, photos of addresses, and portraits of individuals who live in those neighborhoods, I have created Folded Map, which is a project that explores what the present day impact of Chicago's segregation looks like. I started that with photos of addresses, 6900 South Ashland and 6900 North Ashland. The 6900 South Ashland is in the blue part of the map that you just saw and 6900 North Ashland is in the purple part of the map that you just saw. And if you can notice the 6900 South Ashland bus stop uh, does not even have a bench. And the project also includes video of this exact intersection um, so that people can be fully immersed in the stark differences between these uh, intersections that are on the same street, but different sides of town. And as you can see, there isn't even a crosswalk on the South Ashland Street. Then the project evolved to include what I would soon call map twins. These are individuals who live on the same street, but in those different neighborhoods that are 15 miles apart. Like Maurice, the 5400 South Hermitage resident, and 
his MAP twins, John and Paula, 6400 North Hermitage residents. It's through Folded Map that I would have these individuals meet each other to have a conversation about their neighborhood. And I asked them several questions, but one question I will show you a clip of them both answering when they met for the first time is what's missing in your neighborhood? A theater, um, some bowling alley, um, maybe um, some type of center for the youth to kind of go hang out at or have some, some things to do when they get out of school um, or to be able to be exposed to different artistic options to um, just, just kind of give them something to do um, aside kind of like hanging outside and finding different ways or, or getting into trouble um, or those trouble even being an option because if you have nothing to do of course it's like there's trouble waiting right over there mm -hmm. so yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, good suggestions. yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know <laughs> we yeah a lot, of, a lot of our needs are in our neighborhood is yeah I mean I'm, I'm sure I'm sure we could think of something but uh, yeah and now I'm going to show you um, another uh, video footage of the MAP twins explaining to this media outlet, Al Jazeera, um, how meeting each other made them feel and what it helped them realize. That was like a genuine connection, right? It was like nothing forced or fake. We had a conversation. Um, learn each other's differences in community. Um, the things that I talked about or maybe spoke about that I would like to see here in Inglewood, they already had out there. When we spoke to know that they couldn't even imagine being in the community, not having the things that, I guess, basic necessity. So, yeah, it was interesting. I guess it is, it is really striking, uh, you know, how lucky we are and we certainly don't think of ourselves as living in a rich neighborhood but compared to some we, we are very privileged yeah. mm -hmm. and now i will be expanding the project to not only help chicagoans uh, continue to experience other neighborhoods through folded maps action kit uh, this is just a list of errands that I'm inviting people to run in their map to a neighborhood. Errands that allow you to experience how different industries and sectors um, invest or disinvest in certain neighborhoods. So the errands that I invite people to run and share back their experience include going to buy an organic apple, go to take out $20 at an ATM, and go visit a local library. And the hope is that people can share their experience so that they can understand um, how structural racism and segregation really does show up in our, in our lives every day. And as I do a lot of presentations, I have started to include this folded map pledge, uh, which invites everyone to promise that they will visit a grocery store in a neighborhood that is different than their own. And those are the ways in which I have been engaging during the pandemic with the larger public, just creating tools for people to um, single-handedly experience the project uh, in lieu of in-person presentations and the inability to do uh, gallery showings. But thank you so much. I'm so happy to share my project with you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. And I think it's, I'm really excited um, about the idea of doing some errands and kind of changing the way in which I think about the built environment in which we're in. Our next video um, is from Arnun, and she is going to talk um, a little bit about the project that she has done on military families um, based in Kansas. 
Hi everyone, my name is Rin Yoon and my project is called To Be at War and it's about the social impact of war on the military community. So eight years ago, after I got married, I moved on to a military base for the first time. Um, at this time, it was the height of the war in Afghanistan and this is where soldiers came to um, practice simulated warfare right before they deployed. So coming here, I realized how little I knew about this community and this culture. Um, and I kind of realized how unique it was. So I started taking pictures, trying to make sense of my place in this whole structure. And it soon evolved into a documentary project about military families. I guess through photography, um, it was my way of getting to know this community better to engage in it and just to kind of explore some of the issues facing this community. Um, so some of the issues are constant family separations and deployments. There's always the threat of injury and death. And there's a lot of moving. Military families typically move every two to three years. This is Chantel, she's one of the workshop participants and this is every house she's lived in in the past few years. You can see her family growing. Um, she's gone from Hawaii to Belgium to Kansas. When I started doing research, I realized that um, the dynamics of the military has changed a lot in the past few decades. In World War II, 14% of the population served, and now less than 1% of the population serves. So out of this small percentage, um, more soldiers have families than ever before. So this community is really, there's more family members in this community than ever before. And there's also more second and third generation soldiers. They're called legacy families. And so that makes this insular community even more insular. And homecoming can be difficult because it's alienating to come back to a country that doesn't really know what kind of operations you've been engaged in abroad. So a lot of the burden of war comes to fall on the shoulders of military family members. One of the main goals of this project is to bridge that civil military divide through first person storytelling. With the grant from We Women, I was able to provide photography workshops for military spouses and children and just have a space where um, we could just talk freely and build community, which was especially important during the pandemic, and just have a place, a space for healing in a life that has a lot of trauma. And next month, we're going to exhibit the work from the workshop participants at a local park right outside of Fort Leavenworth along the fence on the left and on, along the fence on the right will exhibit um, portraits of soldiers who are mostly the spouses and parents of the workshop participants. And um, I want the, um, the soldiers to represent, you know, this idea of borders and um, the space in between the workshop participants work and the soldiers work to reference this constant family separation. And I'll leave off with a clip of um, Liz's story, which I feel like is really representative of what this life is all about. It's a lot of hardship, but it's also a lot of community. On January 10th, 2009 at 9 p.m., my husband Brent left for Iraq for his second deployment with Echo Company 1-5 First Calf. It was one of the hardest days of my life. And much like the first deployment in October, 2006, there was anxiety, unknown fears and tears. But this time we had our first son, Reed, who was born 11 days earlier on December 31st, 2008. Brent's rifle was slung across his chest, such a contrast to our small, blonde-headed, newborn son sleeping in his dad's arms with not a care in the world. Brent was the company commander, so he called his company to order. He took one last look at me, then Reed, and was gone. I stood there in the cold January night with the realization dawning that I was on my own with this new baby, a first time mom, and my husband was marching off to war. I felt like I couldn't breathe. Then, out of nowhere, I heard my name called and two fellow army wives came running across the field and they embraced me like wings of a bird with reed in the center to keep him warm. And they just held me. And I felt safe because I knew in that instant I was not alone.
I had my army family. And I finally cried. Thank you so much for hearing our stories and I look forward to any questions you may have after the presentation. That was really, really moving. Um, and it really made me think a lot about how dominant narratives of military really don't talk about the people that are part of it and the families that that are involved in kind of protecting a country, representing what the country is. And it's I look forward to talking to you a little bit more about kind of this intimate way in which you've been ca been capturing uh, what the community is able to do. Our third project is um, Katie's project, um, Dear New Talk a project about one of the first regions in the country that had to experience um, forced relocation because of climate change. And this is work based in Alaska. Hi, my name is Katie Basil. I'm presenting from Bethel, Alaska. I'm a photographer, filmmaker, and teaching artist. And my project for We Women is called Dear New Talk, and it focuses on climate change. This is Newtok, and Newtok is one of the first communities in the United States to have to relocate because of climate change. And you can see um, the shoreline, which used to be about a mile and a half out from the village, has now eroded right into the village, and they're losing up to 70 feet of land a year. This is what erosion looks like up close. And in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, we have up to 40 communities that are facing um, threats from erosion, permafrost melt, and flooding. And just to give you a sense of where we are in the world, the blue dot is Bethel, where I am, and the red dot is Newtok. This is Alaska. The post office in Newtok is quite slanted, as you can see, and that's a result of permafrost melt shifting permafrost, which is quite normal, but um, it's gotten so much worse because of climate change. Another shot of the shoreline, the small structure you see, the steam bath has since fallen into the water. This picture was taken in July of 2020. And I started working with the New Talk Village Council and Bethel Community Services Foundation in 2017, we had seen a lot of journalists coming into the region to tell the story of New Talk. And New Talk had, you know, not really had an opportunity to tell the story themselves. And so um, we wanted to do kind of like a from the region perspective. And we documented Albertina Charles, um, a one woman's relocation, which happened in 2019 when she moved from New Talk to Muhtagvik. We were just rolling our film out in 2020 when the pandemic hit. And Albertina's journey went from Newtak to Mukhtagvik. Here's Mukhtagvik built on Nelson Island, which is um, lava rock and historically has no permafrost. And so um, the 100 year study that they did shows that it's a really, it's a safe place to be even with projected sea level rise. This is Albertina. And the purpose of Dear New Talk, the focus is really to gather um, advice from the community on what they've learned through the relocation process. And this is something that the Village Council really wanted to focus on. So Albertina says, talk to the media to help your people. This is Mukhtagovic, America's youngest community. You can see that it's still, it's very much under construction. These photos are from July, 2020. Fishing, hanging fish. And you can see um, one other aspect of this project is to kind of source memories, people's memories from what used to be um, on the land. On the land before the erosion came in. So um, if you can imagine standing on the shoreline of Newtok and looking out, you just see water. But if you're an elder or an adult from that community, you have a lot of memories. And so 
we've been um, collecting those memories and then animating them on maps. So here's an example. A was just a bump, a piece of land that we used to go to to play tag, whatever, you know, as kids. And um, we played on it so much, um, plants couldn't grow there anymore. I remember not wanting it to disappear and it disappeared. That's Charlene's memory. And um, I've done about eight interviews now with different folks about what they remember and a lot of berry picking and egg hunting and um, hunt, hunting for birds, gathering greens. And the, la the latest chapter, um, once school opens again, I hope to resume this side of the project, which is uh, working with the drone certification class in New Talk, where they, the students will actually take the photos of New Talk and will overlay those memory maps on top of them with interviews that they do with their family members. All right, thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Katie. I really, really loved the sort of like multi-dimensional aspect of your project around sort of looking at memory, but also like the intergenerational aspect and like the overlay of the memory map of drones. Like, wow, very, very excited to see how all of this comes. And I really look forward to, I guess we all look forward to COVID being over as well, but for you so that you could continue uh, your work. Our last um, video is uh, from Mahela Rodriguez, who is going to talk, uh, talk to us a little bit about the project that she has created around, um, I don't even know how to say it, like a really, really interesting pop literature um, work, and especially around Latinx communities and how we use that to understand the way in which we see ourselves in the world and as citizens and our ability to vote and be part of American society. Hi everyone, my name is Mayela Rodriguez. I am an artist based in Michigan and my work for We Women is focused on Latinx political participation. I'm really excited to be here today and a huge thank you to Open Society Foundations, we Women Photo and my fellow We Women artists. So my practice centers the power of individual and collective authorship and collection making in the ongoing process of institutional critique and community healing. Inspired by my own positionality and perspective as a Latina, I specifically work within Latinx contexts, spaces, communities, and frameworks. I do this through the facilitation of Cartonera workshops. Cartoneras are cardboard bound hand painted books, often filled with poetry, essays, short stories that came out of Buenos Aires, Argentina in the early 2000s. Comparable to zines, their low fi physical quality undermines traditional literary publishing by making the production and distribution of creative work more accessible. When facilitating these workshops, I invite participants to make a cartonera responding to a particular prompt. They are then free to author their own cartonera filled with a mixture of original work, like poetry, drawings, writings, and sampled materials, such as artworks, chapters from books, music videos, screenshots, song lyrics, etc. A, a prompt in the past that I've used is, what does Latinidad mean to you? Their final book is then added to a growing archive of the moment, demonstrating their perspective within collective consciousness. I've used this method in a number of projects, adapting it to fit different contexts, such as interventions at the University of Michigan and community events in rural California. Mi Voz is my project for We Women. It was intended to be another iteration of my in-person Cartonera workshops. This time I would expand my net of potential collaborators to any and all Latinx folks throughout the state of Michigan prompting us to individually and collectively ask, what is my political power, regardless of age and citizenship status? I was able to host three workshops before the pandemic hit. The first was a college group, the first was with a college group at the University of Michigan, 
the second for a group of middle schoolers at um, a Saturday Spanish school in Ann Arbor, and finally, a self-guided workshop in Ypsilanti, Michigan. This, is a cart uh, this was a cartonera made by Ana, a younger participant during one of these in-person workshops. In her cartonera, Ana explains how being involved in her school and community is her political power. COVID-19 has impacted so much of our day-to-day -day lives, and it's no surprise that Mi Voz was impacted as well. Despite canceled in-person workshops, I was determined to adapt Mi Voz to this crisis in ways that creatively support our community. One way I did this was by creating a weekly online cartonera series called Stay Home, Stay Woke. Stay Home, Stay Woke highlighted issues impacting our statewide and national Latinx communities while simultaneously offering glimpses of hope through advocacy efforts and tangible action. Each, each issue was a weekly roundup of articles, tweets, videos, pertinent to a particular topic. Topics covered included COVID-19, the census, and farm workers. The series was published every Sunday for 14 weeks. This cartonera specifically focused on the realities of health disparities in the Latinx community. And then in the wake of Breonna Taylor's and George Floyd's murders at the hands of the police, Mi Vos made another pivot. Do the Work was a three-part virtual workshop co-led by myself and Stephanie Brown in collaboration with the hosting. During the workshop, participants were invited to contribute to a collection of virtual cartoneras that unpack their proximity to whiteness, their relationship with anti-Blackness, and their personal anti-racism work. With every twist, turn, and trauma that 2020 forced, Mi Vos has adjusted. Despite the unexpected pivots and trajectory changes, Mi Vos illustrates the power of reflection in times of adversity. Of course, Mi Vos's forced flexibility is just one of countless experiences. Thank you again for allowing me to share my work with all of you, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mariela. Thank you so much. I really love um, the do the work, right? Like that's actually a really big part of it is that we just have to be involved and bring ourselves and put our stories there. And I'm, I really love this, that project. So um, let's turn a little time to a, to a panel discussion. And this is a reminder to all of our participants. Please do send us any questions that you have, any comments that you have through the chat function. Um, we have um, my great colleague, Brooke, who will be looking through and sending over questions for us um, and helping us kind of figure out how we're going to keep the conversation going. OK, so I'm going to actually start with Daniela because you're here and you're here as one of the <laughs> co-founders of this project. and. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about how all of this came to be, what drew you to the idea of the women, what made you decide that it was something that you wanted to kind of invest your time and effort into, and, and why is it so necessary? So this group of six incredible women came together. We all work within the photography space, but in very different ways, um, some as curators, some as photojournalists and educators, some as designers. And so with this complementary set of skills, I think we all in our own ways wanted to work together to address the structural issues that we saw as being most pressing within photography, both as an industry and as a tool for storytelling and education. And it, it's always difficult for me to sum up we women in sort of a single line, because I think there are two very pressing central ideas to this project. And one is that historically, the photojournalism and the documentary photography community has been overwhelmingly in the hands of men. And that's not just a higher inequality issue. It's, it's an ethical issue, because it means that we are seen images from photojournalists who quite literally teach us how to see the world and they expose us and introduce us to people and places we'll never encounter. And so when we see stories about sports or politics or arts and fashion or anything 
overwhelmingly through the male gaze and the male experience, that impacts how we understand those stories. That changes the way in which we understand our world. Because even though I think photojournalists and journalists at large have kind of believed for a very long time that we are these impartial, unbiased, fly on the wall, casual observers, the truth is who we are deeply impacts how we move through the world and how we interact with other people and how we photograph other people. So our identities really do matter. And the fact that so much photographic documentation of current events of human history has been made by men is a huge problem. So that's that's one part of it. But then the other problem is that photography itself as a medium, as a discipline, hasn't evolved all that much since it was created. It's deeply extractive. It has kind of been based in this idea that someone, usually that person is Western and white and male, goes into another community to tell a story, leaves that community, publishes in a newspaper or a wire service or magazine, and, and that's the end of the relationship. And the community that has been documented doesn't get any real say in how they are portrayed. They don't really get any say in how the images are disseminated for how long. Uh, and so for us, it was both about who is making the imagery, but also what, how can we change this relationship between, between subject and photographer, which is a word that I think a lot of us really hate and try not to use, but you know, how, how do we blur those lines? How do we make it less about this person is making an image and this person is, is the focus of that image? How do we start to actually make this a collaborative process? That's really, thank you. I mean, I think it's really, um, the through line for that with the work that we do at the Open Society Foundations, I mean, a lot of the work in terms of legal advocacy or movement building or, you know, kind of thinking about how we want to change the world is one, like, all of that work is both um, deeply personal, but also in some ways like universal and like kind of having to like negotiate, I think, you know, what is our view, what is the community's view, a community's view, what is other people's view, and kind of like thinking about that. And, and I really feel as if like, you know, so for storytelling to be such an essential part of this building of movements and changing of the world around us. I mean, so we've really been thinking a lot about how, um, you know, the personal experiences um, can really help us explain and the war, like kind of the human condition and how to connect to other people in a very human way. Um, but there's also a big danger, I think, in terms of leaders, at least like the movement leaders, to end up making the personal story the only story. It's like the dominant narrative kind of question. And um, I'd love to kind of understand a little bit better how you think of yourself in relation to the communities that you are working with. I almost said documenting, but I don't think that's actually the nature of the work. Um, because so many of you, like all of you have deep connections to the communities. Some of you are part of the communities um, that you work in. And so how do you think about the community and the artists or the artists in the community? And how do you balance that and also be, make sure that the work is both deeply personal, but also is able to connect with other people? Um, anybody want to take maybe anybody want to answer that? Yeah. Did you want to go, Daniela? Tonika, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, no, I really appreciate that question um, because I was actually uh, being interviewed yesterday for a new project that I'm doing that is building off of Folded Map. And a question they asked was, um, you know, how will you engage the residents to ensure they have agency? And so the question was really interesting because, you know, I did study journalism. I went to school for journalism. So even the question implies um, that I'm not part of the community, you know, that I am not a resident, that I am not a resident already claiming agency by doing the project. So even in my answer, I had to tell them, um, I'm an artist within the actual community. I am using my art and myself as a conduit to engage this issue that we all collectively as a community want to amplify. So 
you know, even how we think of um, artists being involved or covering uh, an issue within a community, there, there is sometimes a way in which people disconnect the artists from being a part of the community. And um, Folded Map, uh, even though it was my brainchild, it still came from the community because I'm from the community that was deeply impacted by Chicago's segregation. And I have been working hand in hand with other residents um, who have been trying to disrupt segregation and advocate for um, investment in our community. So, you know, it is it is an interesting way to think about the role of an artist um, being from a community that they're covering, as well as, you know, an artist from outside a community. Um, but it is a distinction that I think we we should um, be aware of and not just assume that artists in general don't come from within a community that they're covering. When you when you go to talk to participants about your project, do they see you as an artist or do they see you as from the community? Like how do you how do you negotiate that and have they like do they you have, do you encounter resistance from people in like meeting people from their twin neighborhood? Yes, yeah, so um my community they actually forced me to start calling myself an artist. <laughs> I was just hiding behind my um, advocacy of my neighborhood. I considered myself to be, you know, a concerned resident like my neighbors. Um, and they were the ones that told me, stop it. No, you're a photographer, you're an artist, you're a documenter. Like, we want you to do the thing that you do so you can amplify everything we're all working towards so that's when i was like huh that's okay amazing. yeah and it's like kind of like also like the positionality that comes from like your community telling you you're an artist you can do yes it. so that is how i introduced myself to the participants in folded map um that were outside of my community i was like i'm awesome. an artist from greater inglewood whereas you know my community they were like please please you know, announce yourself as the artist that you are. Stop trying to cover it up. <laughs> that's, I, thank you. That's a really great segue in terms of like stepping into your power uh, for Myla. I mean, I think that that's also one of the questions for you in terms of like, the work that you're doing and kind of encouraging mm -hmm. your community. Tell us a little bit more about kind of how you negotiate that. Yeah, um, for me, Tonika brought up the word agency and I really appreciate how you were kind of critiquing that in relationship to the you know being asked by an interviewer because um, I think always especially when you're a part of the community or you have connection to community there's kind of always that question at the forefront in so many different ways and um, so with with my with my project and what's always kind of been at the forefront and why I've chosen this form of um, these cartoneras, so these cardboard bound books, is that the participants are literally authoring their own story, they're authoring their own narrative, their own perspective. And I think that um, that's something that's super important for me when I think about myself as an artist is that I'm really just kind of here to facilitate a particular experience. Um, and to kind of just set up the parameters that allow individuals to explore their own experiences in a really low stakes way while in community. Um, and then mm -hmm. through that authorship of each of their individual books, they start to create a collection that just shows um, the levels of nuance within each and every one of their perspectives um, within a larger kind of collection. And so for me, um, I think any artist, individual person who exists in um, a non-majority uh, kind of existence, so I'm Latina and, you know, there's definitely this myth of the Latino monolith. 
And my experience is so completely different than another Latino's experience, right? And so I think that having the ability to literally just author your own book um, and just author your own kind of piece of past, present, future with that little tool um, allows you to kind of stake out your uniqueness um, within your own individual experience and then within kind of a larger context. Yeah, well, I love that. Like that. You said like the authorship of your own book, like people feel as if they don't have the the right to, right? Like we don't deserve mm -hmm. to call ourselves the ability to do that. Um, there is a question in the chat um, from our audience, actually, Mayela, around, um, you know, have, that you had opened up a project for the Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. in the wake of the Atlanta shooting. Um, and this is from totally. Filipino Canadian, like, have you considered opening one for and um, about uh, anti-Asian hate? Yeah, I think that the power of these particular workshops is, um, and really what I what I think has been one of the biggest um, realizations for myself personally is the replicability and the flexibility of these workshops. To you know, not they're not limited to a particular group or particular context and they offer a space um, that's therapeutic that's brave that's educational and that's exploratory um and i love the idea of you know you know using them using this kind of reflective experience as a response or a reaction to some of the really horrific or traumatic national and global experiences that we're going through um and so to the person who asked that question thank you that's a really beautiful idea thank you so Arin, i wanted to ask you a little bit about um kind of like you said the community and like the pieces like your community and your project is like very specific um and i think you know one of the one of the things that i learned from all of you and I've been learning is that it's really important to reimagine what photography can do. Um, that it's not just about yeah. you know, being extractive. So, tell me a little bit more about how what have the, what's the experience about like making it a collaborative project, and also kind of how have you how has it impacted you? Well, um, so when I started this project, it was definitely like a very personal exploration. And unlike Eka and Mayela, like I didn't belong in this community. This was like photography was my way of trying to like get to know this community. And as I got to know this community, um, look, at first I felt like really an outsider. But once I was in it, you know, like when I went back into the civilian community, I definitely noticed that there was, you know, a disconnect. So in f photographing this community, um, definitely, and like the issues that affect it, I started thinking about representation a lot. And I wanted to get beyond like the singular image of homecoming, which is what everyone sees in the media. And then when I looked at like my husband John's photos from war, they were just like so different from what I saw in the media also. Like his photos are really personal and they were really raw. You know, there was no like political agenda. They, they weren't slick. And I felt like he was using photography in the same way that I was to kind of explore, you know, this life. And I always thought like our photos were in conversation with each other. So in expanding this project to a, um, a community engagement level, I feel like all these other stories that are being shared and um, are just like informing my projects more and that, you know, it's like my project and my view is like one um, like voice, but like I think as a collective, um, it's just a much stronger project for people to be able to tell their stories, especially in a community that is, I think, often, you know, feels like, they shouldn't say what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And they often used, I mean, I think military families are often used like very performatively as well in, in terms yeah, of and it's very politicized. somebody's like, yeah. yeah, someone else's mythology. So I really appreciated that. Every time I watched, I've seen your project several times, it's still kind of like, you know, it's really good to me like a hit home. Katie, I, um, wanted to turn to you and ask you a little bit about that. So for of all of these projects, it seems as if you are, um, I mean, I assume that you have a connection, but tell us more about that. And then also about how, how you imagine um, kind of the continuing work 
I mean, I think as Daniela also mentioned, you know, that there was, um, there are a lot of great documentary projects that don't involve the people that they're documenting as this part of the story. So why, why were you drawn to the community centeredness of this? Sure, thank you. Um, so I grew up in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta region, this part of Alaska, and this is the traditional and contemporary home of indigenous people, Yupik, Chupik, and Athabascan people. And I am, I'm non-native, I'm white, um, non-indigenous person working in this space, but I've lived here for almost my entire life and I'm raising a family here now. So I think from a very young age, I was hyper aware of um, the role that colonialism has played here. Um, and I think a lot of the stories that were coming out of this area of the world were told by missionaries or journalists from outside or anthropologists. And so when I started my career, I was hyper aware of that and really didn't want to um, push that narrative forward. And I wanted the narrative of, of rural Alaska to originate here. And so the first 10 years of my work was very much teaching artists. So I was working with youth um, and just, you know, trying to facilitate those skills and those stories. Um, and then when the New Talk project came up, um, it was really uh, like there was no other way to do it than to be collaborative about it because we, you know, we asked them that, you know, what do you want your, what do you want the audience to, to come away with? And this was starting with the film project and they identified three things. The first was um, the fact that there's no federal program right now to help fund relocation because of climate change. So FEMA will come in after an emergency, but they won't necessarily come in before. That's starting to shift a little bit. And so the New Talk Village Council really wanted to highlight that. And that was where we really focused the film. And then the second thing was they are literally like the experts of relocating right now, probably, you know, in, in the country, maybe in the world. And so they want to share that information locally because we have so many other communities that are, are facing the same issue with erosion. Um, but also nationally and internationally because coastal communities worldwide are going to face relocation. There's just no question at this point. Um, and then the third thing was uh, the elders we, we talked to, they wanted the youth to be able to see what New Talk looked like. And so, um, you know, we've toyed with uh, virtual sort of virtual reality um, we haven't been able to bring that in yet, but we might. And so in the meantime, we're doing these memory maps. So as far as collaboration goes, I can't I can't imagine doing work here that's not collaborative because I know that my perspective, like while I'm very connected and I love this, my home, I'm, I'm a white person in this space. And so um, I have to be aware of that at all times and making sure that I'm checking in with, with myself and my, the people I'm collaborating with and I'm storytelling with. I think it's also really you might you just discussed kind of brought up a really important question about how we define who are our communities, and all of you have kind of like spoken about that, right? They kind of that communities a are not a static thing, and b that that's the beauty of being in community with people is that you get to grow that and you get to be part of it and get to also kind of change what the community how they see themselves and also how you see yourself and how everyone else sees. So we have one big question that we only have six minutes and I'm gonna throw it out there and whoever wants to answer it can do this. So it's a good question. So it's really about we and women because all of your projects are not only about women and all of your projects are not only just about we as a you and I and like all of those things. So can you talk about the opportunity for I'm going to read this for the intersectional solidarity and healthy but sometimes challenging tensions that may have arisen in the context of creating an organization and bringing together um, diverse groups of projects under the umbrella of the terms we women. You all fight about this when you all have the meetings. <laughs> Why don't we start with Daniela and then everybody else kind of can chime in. Sure. I mean, this, I, I can't tell you how many conversations we had about this. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm the founder of a nonprofit called Women Photograph. Uh, and it's simultaneously this very frustrating pull between gender and the construction of gender is a total myth that we continue to buy into. 
And yet, while we do experience severe inequality on the basis of our gender identity, we still do have to address the elephant in the room. Um, and so we, we went through, I don't know how many different permutations of the name, trying to think, okay, do we reference it directly? Do we, re do we reference it in a more roundabout way? Um, but at, at the end of the day, we did decide that you know women and any gender marginalized group are central to this project, are central to the idea of this particular experience and way of seeing that has historically been excluded from mainstream narratives and specifically mainstream visual narratives. And sorry, I just totally lost my train of thought. Um, where were we going with this? Um, uh, and then just I about mean, all the other people that are also involved, right? So it's like there's like also an element here about like the perspective is also diverse. Right. And so, you know, it's while women is in the name and obviously all of our artists are women and non-binary, um, that, that isn't the end of the way in which we think about what inclusion and diversity is, right? You know, I think when you are working on anything that centers inclusivity, that has to involve conversations about race, that has to involve conversations, not in this case about nationality, because we are very centered on the United States, however we define that, but we did want to make sure, you know, we think about indigenous territory as being uh, something that is maybe defined slightly differently, or, you know, what about Puerto Rico? You know, we like, again, thinking about the expansiveness of how we categorize and how we think of ourselves was really critical to us in, in the development of We Women. Anybody else want to chime in on this? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Katie brings up a very important and thoughtful point of her understanding her identity in the space that is still home to her um, because that's also the same sensitivity I have to have when I am working on um, projects, community engaged projects that really focus on the experience of black people in greater Inglewood. Um, my project not only folded map, but my next project is is focusing on you know legalized theft through discriminatory housing practices. Um, and even though I'm centering that conversation on or telling that story through the black experience, there was no way my conscience could have me ignore the exact um, identical injustice that indigenous people here, specifically in the Midwest, too. Um, have experienced through contracts, through yeah. um, discriminatory uh, practices, land theft. So, um, you know, like Katie, I have to also um, understand that this platform that I'm using to amplify issues that um, my community is going through, it directly connects to injustices experienced by other groups, but specifically indigenous people in this particular um, way. And if you're doing any work that involves with equity, it has to always be inclusive, you know? So who, whoever connects to the story of this experience that I am helping develop through the, the Black experience, um, then they need to be included. So in whatever way they connect to, to this experience of, of legalized theft, of segregation, um, there's opportunity for solidarity. And so I think that is really important and central to um, creating work of, around equity. Thank you. I think that, I think that, you know, we could go on and talk for hours, I think, about all of your work and, and the way in which you're really thinking so thoughtfully both about kind of the 21st century, I guess, a contemporary vision of what um, photography can be, but also kind of in the future of what it could be and like the world in which that we're able to imagine. Um, it, and I guess we have a round from all of you. If there's one thing that you would want our audience to walk away from today with, um, one message, could you tell us what that key message would be? I'm going to set up our end. Um, you know, I just learned so much from hearing everyone else's stories, and that's why I love this project so much. And I definitely, like Tanika said, like, just feel the solidarity. I think there's so much um, strength in storytelling and so much healing that can be done with, like, participatory art. 
So yeah, just like continue to follow these stories. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, I think that I think that through this project and kind of talking with the other artists in this group that I'm so fortunate to be a part of, I've just started to see a lot of um, similarities of kind of what the root causes of our the issues we're working on. And so I think, you know, reflecting on that, that um, there are links, you know, I see I as we've spoken, I've heard about colonialism. Um, patriarchy, white supremacy, these are patterns that keep coming up. And I think we should, you know, just pay pay attention to that and keep digging into it together from different perspectives. Thank you. Mayala? Um, I, have, I have a couple of thoughts. One is that community-based art and community-based photography um, Kind of go hand in hand with organization and political advocacy community advocacy and that um it's just really well suited to react um and to pivot and adapt based on community needs and that's a really um powerful ability and then the second thing is um just how necessary especially now where everyone can have a thought put out into the world really quickly um, with social media um, and activism can be done virtually in very performative ways. Um, I think the time and space for reflection is more necessary than ever for um, creating really meaningful, sustainable um, action and change. Thank you. Tanika? Yeah. You're on mute. What they've said is so eloquent and beautiful. You know, I just high five and ditto everything. <laughs> Daniela, do you have anything? I do. I, and I actually remembered the thing that I completely spaced on in the last question, which was um, just very briefly that, you know, while we women sounds like it is very much centering the experience and the gaze of women because it is, you know, often I find that particularly in the photojournalistic space, women and non-binary artists are pigeonholed into telling women's stories. And the one of the, you know, fundamental points of we women is that all critical issues impact women, whether it's segregation or climate change or any any of these things, um, you know, women are, are deeply impacted, sometimes more so, sometimes, you know, at a greater structural cost. And, you know, I think that's one takeaway. And then the other for me is always, you know, I, I do a lot of teaching and what I always say to students is I, I want them to think about who tells our stories, because what, you know, what greater fabric of human existence do we have than the ways in which we pass on information to our children and the ways in which we remember and the ways in which we commemorate things, you know, famous people and people we consider heroes. So thinking about who is in charge of crafting those narratives, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, movies, journalism, textbooks, um, I think that's the thing that I always ask people to think about as much as they can. Thank you. I, feel, I think that for me, one of the biggest takeaways is that it's really important to reconceptualize um, who gets to be a producer and consumer of art um, and that the how of the work is really as important as the what, you know, like kind of placing it within communities, engaging with that. I mean, we didn't even get a chance to talk about financing, um, but also kind of how we democratize the production and consumption of art, I think is a really important piece of all the things that you guys have talked about today. So thank you all really for this really wonderful hour um, that we spent together. And um, I look forward to seeing so much more. There is a final plug, I know, Daniela, about how we're supposed to talk about how it's going to go, like the, the, the exhibit is actually going to go places. 
Yes. I mean, we actually, we had a team meeting today and we got to review the designs for our banners and they are so stunning and I can't wait for you all to be able to see them. Um, but please do connect with us. Our website is wewomenphoto.com. You can find us on every social media outlet available at We Women Photo. Um, we have a newsletter. Please do uh, connect with us, learn more about each of these incredible artists. There are 19 projects in total um, and, you know, sign up to hear more about the touring exhibition that's going to be going all across the United States. It will be just stunning. Very, very cool. Well, thank you well, all very much. I did think of something I wanted to say. <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> you all inspired me. I just wanted to say, because uh, I thought about our audience. I'm like, you know, these are uh, amazing creatives that we're talking to or educators. And I just wanted to say, um, you know, when I was a teaching artist, one thing I would always tell my students and remind myself is that um, the work you create uh, says so much more about you than it does who you're documenting. And so to always be mindful of what your work is revealing about yourself and about what it is you're paying attention to, um, because we can learn so much about ourselves and where our blind spots are uh, through this beautiful medium of photography by simply paying attention to what our work is showing us about our vantage point. So I, I just I want people to you know keep that in mind as you as you create the work that you do. Thank you. And that's why I always say do the work. Right? You have to do it in order to be able yeah. to do all of this reflection. Well, thank you all. Have a great evening, afternoon, wherever you are, morning, and um, look forward to seeing more of your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you much. Bye. So Bye. nice to be with you Bye. all. Yeah. <laughs>